this price? Yes. Just another thing. It sounds like Professor Stitt has extraordinary and compelling reasons. Mm. <laughs> 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 um, as you know from my written statement, which I'm not going to recount here, um, I believe that the Comasha release program is not used as intended because the BOP has arrogated to itself the decision of whether a prisoner who otherwise meets the criteria actually deserves to be released. Until the BOP relinquishes that role, we will continue to see stories like the ones contained in my statement of prisoners denied, not because they didn't meet the criteria, but because the BOP believes they should not go home. As it turns out, right after I submitted my testimony last week, I received a letter from a prisoner that convinced me again that the question that you asked at the end of the issue for comment is the most important question of all. Should the Commission provide that the BOP not withhold a motion if the defendant meets any of the circumstances listed as extraordinary and compelling reasons in Section 1B1.13? <laughs> and I think absolutely that should be done. And here is what I learned from the prisoner who wrote uh, to me and from his pro bono counsel with whom I consulted afterward. In 2004, he was sentenced to 300 months for convictions stemming from his operation of an asbestos abatement company. His crimes were, if serious, nonetheless nonviolent. He has excelled in prison, he's bettered himself, assisted others, and achieved and received commendations from wardens and from staff. On November 2nd, 2014, his wife suddenly and unexpectedly passed away and left behind their three minor children. No family member could take them in, and the children were taken in by, by kind neighbors. No one in the family had stepped up when, on March 30th, 2015, the father requested compassionate release from the warden. A month later, the warden recommended to the Bureau of Prisons that they release this gentleman because they could find no family member willing and able to take care of the children. While the lack of um, any family caregiver alone should be enough to prompt a motion for compassionate release to the court, as is evidenced by it being in one of the examples that you use um, for extraordinary and compelling reasons, this family space faced very, very special challenges. As the warden's recommendation to the Central Office of the Bureau of Prisons pointed out, the eldest child, Junior, was born with multiple congenital and developmental conditions that make him extremely medically fragile. He had Vater syndrome, a series of congenital malformations and renal and limb abnormalities, among other things. He suffers as well from autism. He must have special treatments throughout the day to help his body eliminate waste, and his medication and antibiotic regimen must be closely monitored and strictly adhered to. He has had 14 surgeries in his 15 short years of life, including the implant of a donor kidney, which is the only kidney he has. In short, he requires constant, round-the-clock personal care to keep him alive, maintain his dignity, and help him thrive. Both his parents were specially trained to provide for those needs, and both did so until his father was incarcerated for offenses that occurred before he was born. After his wife's death, the neighbors who took the children in became overwhelmed with the round of clock responsibilities for which they were not trained. Mistakes were made. The child um, landed in the hospital uh, for a while. In October 2015, they announced they could no longer care for the children. The small family was separated. The younger children went off to another state to live with a relative. That relative refused to take Junior, the eldest, with the medical concerns. Today, Junior lives in a foster home with strangers, and the state is having looked and failed to find a family member to take Junior in, is taking steps to declare Junior neglected by his father. Finding a neglect is the first step uh, in the process of terminating parental rights. Fifteen months have passed since the death of the mother. Nine months have gone by since the warden recommended the father's release. His letter to me expressed his deep concern for his children's emotional well-being and especially the terrible toll that these losses have taken on, on his eldest son, Junior. Yet no one has communicated with the father officially regarding his recommend, the recommendation, uh, since the recommendation was made, rather. The father did learn informally that a division that advises the Office of General Counsel about compassionate release was recommending against the release because it could not be proven that there was no family member capable of caring for all the children. A request for an opinion with the U.S. Attorney's Office has been pending for some time. That no, fam that no family member will take Junior in has been clearly established by the state's effort to find a family member and then moving to terminate uh, the father's rights. This prisoner clearly meets the criteria enunciated by the commission in section 1B1.13. Something else has to be going on here. And I don't know if, if your proposed guidance to, to the Bureau of Prisons to not withhold a motion if the prisoner meets the criteria would result in this prisoner's release. I would hope so, but it's up to the judge. Uh, 
I do believe that including that guidance should send a clear message from this body to the Bureau of Prisons to confine itself to the task of determining who in this population meet the criteria that you enunciate and moving the court for their release. The rest should be up to the court. Thank you. Judge Harris and the commissioners, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. As, uh, as Judge Sarah said, I'm an associate professor of medicine at UC San Francisco, where I specialize in geriatrics, which is the care of older adults, and in palliative care, which is the care of the seriously ill. My work as an academic focuses on older and seriously ill prisoners, and I also train criminal justice professionals in geriatrics and palliative care. So the issues that bring me here today are threefold. First, a precipitous rise in the number of older prisoners. Second, a rise in illness-related prisoner mortality. And third, that evaluations of compassionate release, which we heard this morning, uh, have revealed opportunities for improvement. I'll offer my medical perspective on these three issues, and I offer my opinion that there really is a critical role for the medical profession in health-related policies, and I applaud you for inviting me today. I'll start with three policy recommendations related to older prisoners. First, I would recommend that the Commission recommend to the Bureau of Prisons that they lower the age of eligibility for evaluation of age-related release policies to 55 years. This is because, as you heard a little bit before, many prisoners experience so-called accelerated aging, which they appear to be on average 10 to 15 years older than they are. Because age-related compassionate release policies are intended for prisoners whose incarceration will require considerable complex health care and potentially considerable health-related needs at high cost, the definition of older prisoners should take into account this, this concept. The most conservative approach here would, use, would be to use the age of 55 or older. Second, I recommend eliminating requirements of a minimum number of years served before older prisoners can be assessed for compassionate release. For example, as we heard a little bit this morning, requiring at least 10 years served runs the risk of penalizing the exact prisoners for whom the policy is intended to reach. Uh, those who've served a reasonable proportion of a relatively short sentence who are not deemed or are unlikely to be deemed to be a safety risk. Third, I agree with this concept of adding a, a terminology like aging-related chronic or serious medical conditions to eligibility guidelines, but I caution that it will be very important to list specific examples of what is meant by those chronic or serious medical conditions to ensure that the policy includes serious conditions that are common with advanced age, such as advanced dementia and debilitating physical impairment. Next, I have two recommendations about eligibility criteria for prisoners with serious or life-limiting illnesses. I, first, I recommend that medical eligibility criteria reflect the limitations in the science of prognosis. Unfortunately, prognosis is a very difficult and inexact science. When it's applied correctly, it provides merely a probability of death over a very general time frame. For many serious illnesses, it's actually extremely difficult to pinpoint the exact month or day in which a patient will die. And because of this, physicians are very unwilling and uneasy um, and very reluctant to prognosticate at all. And when they do, multiple studies have shown that physicians are far more likely to actually overestimate prognosis. So they expect that their patients are going to live much longer than they actually do. But physicians are much better at prognosticating the trajectory of serious illness. And what I mean by this is that it's easier for a physician to say that within the next several months, this patient in front of me is bound to develop such profound cognitive or mental or physical incapacity that they are going to require 24-hour nursing care uh, if they have not died already. So I strongly recommend that in addition to life expectancy, sort of an estimated number of months, eligibility criteria include this other perspective, a physician's assertion that a prisoner with a serious condition is on an end-of-life trajectory that's heading towards 24-hour uh, nursing care in the upcoming months. I also recommend that this definition of serious illness be expanded to reflect terminal illnesses that are often profoundly debilitating for several years before they lead to death, things like end-stage dementia, where people can live for multiple years, um, certainly months, uh, or end-stage end organ disease like heart failure, where they are quite debilitated. Second, I recommend that the compassionate release policy should be reviewed by a panel of healthcare professionals on a regular basis to ensure that it keeps pace with current medical evidence. I recognize this might be beyond the Commission's uh, purview, but I have to say it as a medical professional. And I'm going to end with four very brief recommendations that I elaborated on in my uh, written testimony that are related to some of the health-related administrative burdens that can limit uh, access to compassionate release. 
So the first is that it's going to be important to include guidelines for the appointment and training of surrogates. For those prisoners who may meet eligibility criteria but are simply unable to initiate or complete the application process themselves, either because they're too sick, too cognitively impaired, or have too low health literacy. Second, I recommend streamlining the review process. We heard a little bit about that this morning. Third, I recommend developing a fast track options for prisoners who are deemed by a physician to face imminent death. And fourth and finally, because very few correctional health care providers are trained specially in the care of older and seriously ill patients, I recommend training select medical and custodial care in geriatrics and palliative care, and also in how to impl implement whatever final compassionate release policy is developed. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for me to be able to testify on behalf of the American Correctional Association regarding compassionate release. In considering your decision on the proposed amendments, I'd like to provide you with some context regarding the care and treatment of offenders in corrections, some of the challenges corrections professionals face, and end-of-life planning in correctional settings. As background, the American Correctional Association is the oldest and largest professional correctional organization in the world. We represent all disciplines within corrections profession, adult and juvenile, prisons and jails, community corrections, academics, and others. Our members come from local, state, federal, and private prisons, and international. ACA promotes excellence in corrections by offering several forms of professional development, certification, facility accreditation, and by regularly publishing research and surveys to the field. As you are well aware, the current federal offender population and many states' populations have risen to unsustainable levels. Roughly 10% of the current federal offender population is over the age of 55. We heard some of that this morning. However, the cost associated with providing them with their constitutionally mandated care and treatment is an enormous obligation on the federal budget just as it is for the state correctional systems with aging offender populations. It is estimated that 3,300 inmates died of natural causes each year, or die of natural causes each year. As offenders age, it's critical that corrections accommodate the needs of its geriatric or terminally ill offenders. The ACA's public correctional policy on correctional health care states that incarcerated individuals or those in custody of criminal justice and juvenile justice agencies have a legal right to adequate health care in accordance with generally recognized professional standards utilizing comprehensive holistic approaches that are sensitive to cultural, age, gender responsive needs for a growing and diverse population. Whether they are offenders or elderly or both, sometimes those with serious illness feel guilty about their circumstances. In particular, the guilt stems from the perceived hardship or burden it imposes on others physically, emotionally, and financially. The question becomes, how can we possibly secure quality care for offenders as they die? Correctional facilities are crowded, thus stretching the facility's staff and resources to their limits and beyond. Healthcare budgets are lean and often insufficient. ACA has several standards through its accreditation process throughout our publication manuals requiring facilities and agencies to meet chronic care and special health care needs of all offenders either through available resources within the agency or by timely transfer of an, of an offender to an appropriate treatment facility that can meet their needs. The public correctional policy on correctional health care adopted by ACA requires health care programs for offenders include comprehensive medical, dental, and mental health services and that such programs should establish hospice services for the terminally ill offenders supported by a compassionate release programs for those who qualify. For corrections like in the community, care for the terminally ill should start long before the final weeks of life. 28 correctional systems in the United States offer special care, treatment, and programming for geriatric offenders. 
A number of systems also accommodate the needs of geriatric offenders in special sections of one or more of their units. Iowa, Louisiana, and Texas have complete facilita facilities dedicated to the geriatric care. Thirteen states have laws in place for early release of geriatric offenders. However, most of these jurisdictions combine the requirements for those for terminally ill offenders. Forty-three states provide special services for offenders who are chronically or terminally ill, including chronic care clinics, separate housing units, palliative care, hospice services, skilled nursing, separate prison hospitals, and inpatient medical referral centers like in the Bureau of Prisons. Twenty-six states have statutes that place in place for the early release of terminally ill offenders under the title Compassionate Release. Conditions for release include being mentally incapacitated or physically incapable of engaging in criminal activity, receiving clemency approval from the governor, or having a life expectancy less than one year. There are a number of departments. The main Department of Corrections provides great hospice programs for those individuals who are within their care, and Maine has been very successful in what they've done. In Louisiana, the Angola prison, operated by Warden Burl Kane, had a great hospice program that included the use of uh, inmates uh, uh, to take care of those inmates who aren't able to be released, and it's showing great, great promise. They've put that program in six of their other facilities. Uh, they've also received an award from the American Hospital Association for what they do. And in the state of New York, they have two forms of release, one uh, medical parole and the other uh, parole that's done by a full board that takes a look at those cases on a case-by-case -case basis. Also in New York, the warden at facilities, I'm sorry, the, the commissioner, with advice from the warden, have been given the ability to also release individuals um, from the facility if, that necess if that's necessary. Thank you. Do any of the states have anything that look like our system where you go back to the court, or is it all the power within the warden or the parole commission? I think in different cases, um, especially in the, in, in the case of uh, uh, New York and um, uh, in Kansas, uh, they've built in uh, a network where uh, the process runs through the Department of Corrections, but they also have to have advice and consent from the judge uh, and or the parole board and uh, also victims. So there's a mechanism for them to be able to contact all of those entities to get a response. I, I was uh, interested in your, in your written testimony that uh, New York State had a rule about 50 percent. You have to have served 50 percent of the term, uh, and that would be across the board, not just terminally ill, but uh, elderly and so forth. Um, though it disqualified certain offenses for being considered. I think it was 50 percent of nonviolent offenders. How has that worked? Is that, it, it, would you say that's been a success? Would you say that it results in, in a lot of people who are ostensibly, uh, 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 you know, low in terms of recidivism? Um, has, it, has it been successful, not successful? I've not done enough research or have the information to be able to convey that to you. What I was able to do was to find the different programs that are in effect around the country. I'd be happy to provide that information with the commission. I'd be interested whether New York's, you know, we want to take a look, I, I do anyway, want to take a look at other states that have this program uh, and try to figure out whether it makes sense to have like 10 years or it has X percentage or it makes sense to restrict it to certain types of offenses. So I would be very interested in, in the success. Do you have any? Information um, you know, just a few weeks ago in the New York Times, a colleague of mine wrote about one of her patients who was in New York, one of the New York State prisons. So he was a 60-year-old prisoner. He had metastatic liver cancer. It had rendered him virtually paralyzed. Uh, he was going to be eligible for parole within the year. His wife and children were desperate to care for him at home. Everybody agreed that there was a good uh, parole plan in place and a hospice care plan in place. His prison physician had already petitioned for early release several months ago. His health declined quickly in prison while he was awaiting um, uh, New York to make a decision. He was admitted to a nearby hospital, which was approximately two hours away from where his wife and children lived. On the night he died, his wife was in her car making the long drive home, and a date re to review his application was scheduled for 
over a month after the day that he died. Do you, do you have a sense of costs? Do you, do you have a sense of how much, in terms of medical costs, uh, are devoted to end-of-life care? And I, I know that it, that's a sort of soft term that you really have to define, but do you have, can you give us some information on that subject? Uh, so two answers. One answer is what we do know is that older adults account for approximately four to nine times the cost of younger prisoners to incarcerate. Some of the problem with understanding exactly what health care related costs are is that first of all, many states uh, are not actually obligated to release some of that information. Secondly, there's a real question about what is a health care related cost. I mean, do you, are the costs associated with officers who are Stand, two officers who are standing with a comatose patient in a hospital, you know, collecting their overtime, is that a health-related cost or is that a corrections cost? So there are some questions about how to even really start to drill down on what exact health care-related costs are. I will say that recently we looked at one state, um, and I'm not actually sure if this is publicly available data, so I have to find out before I give the commission the information about this. But we looked at one state, and we looked at prisoners who had died within the last two years, and we found that uh, health care related costs were exorbitantly higher uh, in the last year of life than they were on average uh, for Medicare recipients in the, in the community. And those are just the very specific hospitalization and health care related costs. So I can't exactly answer your question. What I can say is that if you're asking about cost, the answer is really, really high. general report discusses the medical costs um, as they relate to aging prisoners in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So that information should be available, at least for them. I understand you're objecting a little bit to putting a, a, a certain time period on what terminal means because you say that doctors can't predict. Um, so I, I understand what you're recommending is just using the word terminal and chronic. Is, what would your exact wording be? So um, great question. I. I I guess I would, I would back up for a minute and say physicians can uh, prognosticate in cer certain circumstances. You know, we're very good at saying the person in front of me is probably going to die in the next 48 hours, and I'm really good at saying a 7-year-old girl is probably going to live for another 80 years. And then everything sort of in the middle depends on what the condition is that I'm being asked about. So there are certain solid tumor metastatic cancers where the, where the end of life trajectory is very clear and it's very predictable, and I can make a recommendation about that. Um, what's less easy to make a, make a prognosis about is some of the debilitating conditions that are becoming more and more common with an aging prisoner population, things like dementia, things like profound functional impairment, things like end organ disease like liver failure and heart failure. Some of these conditions actually have more of a kind of oscillating um, trajectory where it's very difficult to see where in that process the patient necessarily is until way at the end of their condition. So what I would say is that um, in terms of terminology, number one, it'll be important to think about different trajectories of end-of-life illness, which is why I say serious and advanced life-threatening condition um, with profound cognitive or functional impairments. And so uh, I think that there are times when a physician can say this is a patient with a terminal life-limiting illness, but there are times when we can say this is a life-limiting illness with a clear trajectory towards cognitive and functional impairment in the next one to two years. So, so the exact language would be? <laughs> I'm an academic. Are you really asking me to make an exact? Oh, yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> the exact terminology would, uh, would be advanced, uh, serious advanced illness um, with a clear terminal trajectory. You know, I just read a compelling book over the weekend, um, When Breath Turns to Air. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to read that about a 37-year-old who was diagnosed with a neurosurgeon mm -hmm. with, with stage 4 lung cancer. And, and it's now coming to me as you're speaking, there was a point at which he says to his doctor, tell me about the graph. How, mu how long do I have to live? And she knew and wouldn't tell him mm -hmm. uh, because they don't, don't want to take away hope, I guess, is right. the theory. But, but, but what was true from that book, anyway, and I just want to know if you agreed, is that actually there are graphs out there. Yeah, there are graphs. And there are, um, there are very clear sort of four or five general trajectories, and they differ um, where, uh, you know, there, there are trajectories, like I said, the metastatic solid tumor cancer. There are 
uh, there is a, an advanced illness that is caught sort of very quickly and has a very profound uh, cliff where people sort of move along and then suddenly, you know, there's just a matter of a couple of weeks and then they've died. There's sort of the sputtering decline. Um, so there are a lot of different trajectories, but there's a lot of different ways that people die, but really they fall into four or five overarching trajectories. And is 18 months consistent with that with most, I mean, they keep expanding at 6, 12, 18. I think they're trying to be expansive. Yeah, I think that they're trying to be expansive. And I think the, the question really is um, how, how, how much do you want the physician, how much do you want to pin down the physician? What's the wording that the physician has to say, this person is going to be dead in 18 months? Is it there's a 50% chance that this person's going to be dead? More likely true than not true. More likely true than not true. I would agree with that. So more than 50% likelihood that the person's going to be dead in the next 18 months because what happens is even if they're not dead, they're probably going to need 24-hour nursing care in those 18 months. So that's, so and a physician feels much better about saying that than they do about the so exact that's date. The standard, the BOP actually is sort of is moving is, is in that direction. In the right direction. Yes, yes. Um, so I have a couple questions. Um, first, for Dr. Williams, with the list that you have, is there any concern with any of these about malingering? Because I'm just going to mm -hmm. guess that part of the delay at the department or the bureau is making sure someone really is as ill as they're saying they are. Mm -hmm. So when thinking especially about dementia or things, are, are, will all of these be pretty easily validated, proven, or is it the kind of thing that is, is subject to debate and it may be more difficult for an inmate to actually show this is a real thing? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's hard to make a general sweeping uh, kind of opinion about that because there are so many different types of diseases that cause death. Uh, what I would say is, Again, from my perspective, we're talking about eligibil medical eligibility for evaluation. And so this is sort of the first gatekeeping door. And then, of course, I mean, there's, I can only imagine, and I also know, that there's a whole host of considerations that come into play. I mean, people are being watched when they don't know they're being watched. There are medical records that may document when the disease happened, whether or not there have been improvements or unexpected, unexpected worsenings, you know, in the week before. Um, request for release, you know, so I think that there's, there's a whole slew of documentation that um, is incorporated into decision making that is beyond just the, the diagnosis. What I would say is, you know, 50% of people over the age of 80 have dementia, that uh, in the, criminal justice, in the cr criminal justice population, this is a lot higher. Uh, there have been insufficient studies to show how high the um, burden of severe age-related cognitive impairment and dementia is in the, criminal justice in the criminal justice population. But suffice it to say, early studies are showing an extremely high number of people have this. And so I think that question of malingering, you know, uh, when you look at population estimates, that is also something that goes into ferreting out what is malingering and what is uh, real diagnosis. And also um, for uh, Ms. Price, I'm curious uh, where you see the where are the delays happening at BOP? If you have a sense from the groups, you, is it, so you gave the example of the warden was for it, and it's the central office that seems to have slowed things down, and then it seems like in other instances it's that there's no filing by the. Do you have a sense if there's any rhyme or reason into kind of where the bottleneck occurs? It probably happens at all levels. It was an important step to remove the regional office uh, review that. Um, Kathleen Kenny mentioned to you earlier that took out a step that could take quite a long time because the regional offices, you know, would sometimes sit on these for, for a fairly long period of time. I, I think that there are probably delays at all levels. One of the things that the Inspector General's report on compassionate release pointed out is that there was confusion at all levels of the Bureau of Prisons about its own criteria and its own guidance on this. And so there were delays perhaps, for example, in determining some of the elderly prisoners who were made eligible um, in 2013. There was a great deal of confusion nonetheless at the institution level about those criteria. So they had to write new guidance for them and add that to the, so that slowed everything down. And while that was happening, as I understand it, a lot of these decisions were sitting in the central office because, uh, because even though the, for, the wardens had forwarded opinions, there wasn't sort of this finality about what is our actual final uh, determination of what an elderly prisoner is with a, with a medical condition. So 
Yeah, I think some of it has to do with um, institutions <clears throat> not being clear. Um, I, I tell the story of a, of a woman who, who, like the gentleman I just discussed, um, lost her husband who was caring for their children. And um, several times she reached out uh, to staff to help her with a compassionate release. And even though it had been um, enunciated already by the Sentencing Commission that this was a ground, they, and, and the Bureau of Prisons says that they um, had advised the institutions about what the Sentencing Commission had provided as grounds for compassionate release. The staff were unaware and said, look, you need, go need to, you need to go read our manual because this clearly doesn't fall within this. So lots of time was wasted right there. So on a case-by-case -case basis, I can't always tell, um, I, and I certainly am not inside the process enough to know, but I, but I do know that sometimes um, certainly there are significant delays once um, as this gentleman's um, uh, uh, recommendation is certainly undergoing. There are significant delays once um, a recommendation from a warden reaches the central office. Now, they're also reaching out to the U.S. Attorney, and there may be delays associated with that. But again, I don't have an inside track on that at all. Do, do any of you know, is there any model out there where there isn't a gatekeeping function done by the Department of Corrections, if there's any alternative model without flooding the course? Or what, is this it? Is this like the... This is. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So, Dr. Dr. Williams, um, yeah. when when you get to your recommendations in recommendation three, uh, you recommend corresponding with your first recommendation, lowering the age of eligibility um, for those with um, qualifying medical conditions to 55 or 50. Uh, my question is, from your perspective, just from a medical perspective, is there really any reason to have an age requirement for that one at all? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and so, you know, I do you what, what I, they yeah, are. They I, I think that chronic, that's or, yeah, that's a great that's a great point. And I would say no. Um, when <laughs> actually, uh, you make a great point. But in geriatrics, what we say is age is just a number. And uh, that that actually is not right. There are there are 70 year olds who run marathons, and there are 30 year olds who are, you know, m multiple gunshot wound victims who are in who are paralyzed, and they look much more like the uh, they develop many more of the sort of so called accelerated aging characteristics that we think of for people in their 80s uh, and their 30. So I think that you're absolutely right, and I would I would agree with that assessment. Yes. I'm curious, have you worked with institutions other than BOP to help them set their standards? Well, to be clear, I actually have not worked with BOP to set standards. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, I have um, I've, uh, worked a bit with, um, with two different states, uh, really people who are uh, making recommendations to their, um, to their policies and sort of weighed in on those two policies. Yeah, so actually at one point, um, if I'm not mistaken, New York State had a surrogate model. Um, the, the surrogate model makes a lot of sense because it's really grounded in the science of palliative care, which really does show us that the vast majority of people who have a terminal illness, whatever we decide to call it, um, have cognitive incapacity, even if they don't have dementia per se, they have some degree of cognitive incapacity that would make the process of petitioning and pulling all the work together and identifying sort of all the processes that they need to follow to make the petition successful, extremely problematic. And frankly, older adults have been shown, older prisoners have been shown to be the population who is sort of the most unbefriended and least likely to have continuing relationships with people outside. So they don't sort of have necessarily the same likelihood of a built-in surrogacy um, sort of community that could come to their aid as well. Yeah, I was I was um, alerted with your choice of words that there are people who otherwise would qualify, uh, Ms. Price. Yes, uh, to uh, for compassionate release, but but didn't, or weren't, or the motion was made too late, or something of that nature. And because I don't quite know what it means to say otherwise qualify, since under the statute, I think the Bureau of Prisons can take into account any number of things. I think the interesting question is how many of these people who apply would qualify under the medical aspect of it, but under the other aspects, which are the other 3553A factors, would not. 
in the in the in the warden or the director of prisons uh, judgment. So my question to you is, has there been that type of analysis? Have you looked and said, look, if they only just did the medical, but didn't do the other 3553A factors, what would, the, what would the statistics show? I don't know of any study. I mean, it certainly would show more motions, to, if that's what you're getting at. Well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, I, I don't know that I want more motions or fewer motions. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. What, what is happening? How long is it taking? Why are these people, and they denied compassionate release, what's the reason for it? Is the reason well, medical? Is the reason uh, the victims? Is the reason the nature and circumstances of the offense? Mm -hmm. We have the New York situation where maybe certain offenses you simply don't qualify. And I think the research that would be helpful <laughs> would be what is going on and also how long it takes. Well, I, I do know of a number of cases. We talk about them in our report, um, and they're discussed elsewhere. A number of cases where people who clearly met the criteria were um, soon to die, nonetheless were not released because, in the Bureau of Prisons' opinion, um, they hadn't served a long enough sentence that has been cited. Um, their crime was too serious. In the case of Michael Mahoney, whose case I, I discuss in this case, in this, uh, in our testimony rather. Um, because the nature of his offense, although when one took a close look at it, the judge himself asked for the motion to be presented. So there are a number of reasons extraneous to the determination that the person fits underneath the 1B1.13 criteria or even the Bureau of Prisons medical criteria um, that are cited by the Bureau of Prisons for um, the proposition that they're not going to bring the motion. And of course, once the motion isn't presented, the court has no jurisdiction. Um, to consider this. The gentleman who, I'm t who I talked about today in my testimony, there's no way, I mean, he happens to have a lawyer who's sort of sending material and information to the Bureau of Prisons, but there's no way for him to meaningfully interact with this, this conclusion that has been reached by at least one component of the Bureau of Prisons that um, there's somebody out there who's going to take care of his children. There's no process. And if this, if this was to move into the courtroom, if the Bureau of Prisons was going to bring the motion, they could say, look, we think there might be somebody out there. At least somebody could step into that process and say, no, Judge, there really isn't, and here's the evidence. We have the, the state moving to terminate his parental rights for this very reason. But they never get to that point. Um, I want to thank the whole thank the whole panel, but in particular Dr. Williams. I think your testimony is exactly the kind of information that the working group that we talked about earlier um, that the department is heading um, can focus on in order to develop um, new guidance. And so I thank you for that in particular. Um, and I do thank uh, Ms. Price and Ms. Williams for the, and Dr. Williams um, for the sort of heartbreaking stories that you brought, to, brought before us. Um, Undoubtedly, again, this is a very, this is a very difficult topic, and these and these are very sad situations. But we are talking today mostly about the idea of broadening the pool of motions that the Bureau of Prisons would be filing. And I, can you tell me what you think the? It seems to me, from what you've told me, that both of these um, cases that you mentioned, of course, Dr. Williams is a state court, so it's not quite applicable. Um, I don't see how broadening the, the pool at BOP would actually have any impact on those types of cases. In um, Dr. Williams' case, for example, it's only the BOP. The BOP actually recommended it, not the BOP, but the state prison system. Um, in the case of, of Ms. Price's example, it just seems to me that it would be, it could, again, as I mentioned before in my question to, the, to Mr. Horowitz, I worry that broadening the pool would actually take away from the most eligible um, applicants and if you think you can you talk about your your thoughts about how broadening the pool the impact that that would have on cases such as the ones you raise the statute um, calls for the motion to be brought when a prisoner presents extraordinary and compelling reasons um, and I think that the reason we're talking about broadening the pool at all is because it's been so narrow for so long. There are uh, m more reasons why people ought to at least be considered for a reduction in sentence than have reached the courts uh, until now. I don't worry about the resource issue. I know you raised that question earlier about whether or not this would take away resources if we're going to go out there and sort of hunt up all these people who are aging and so on and so forth. But really. Um, what you are talking about is resources that are currently being spent 
on an aging population that's extraordinarily uh, expensive to support and maintain with dignity. Um, we're talking about maintaining people who are dying in prison who need um, uh, round-the-clock care, who we, they have to um, train prisoners to do hospice care for them because the staff are not um, trained, eligible, or able, and maybe can't by reunion rules support them. So yes, let's broaden the pool as broadly as we can. And I think what it will do in the balance is if we're moving some of the people who are the most expensive people to maintain a system, we'll actually make more resources available. And I think that was the point of uh, Mr. Horowitz's uh, report as well. I do. I don't see how that's responsive to her question. Oh, sorry, well, you uh, didn't I mean, it seems to me that if you broaden the pool, um, perhaps more will get consideration, but it doesn't change the problem with the example that you provided us, right? I mean, if 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 that person was eligible under the current criteria. It's not getting relief. How does broadening the pool help it? Right, broadening the pool does not help. It doesn't. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. No, it doesn't. And my point about presenting that story wasn't about broadening the pool. You already broadened the pool to include him. That, right. that was a change that the commission wisely made a couple of years ago. Well, then the, the question, problem that the, I have. But, but the second part of her question is that if we broaden the pool, though, that will mean more motions or more more request for BOP to file motions. And that will necessarily tax whatever finite resources BOP has. Now, whether or not, I mean, I, I understand you. Your, your response on that is there's a lot of money to be saved for those who are released um, through a proper um, program. Um, that'd be true now, right? <laughs> Um, it, 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 and maybe even more true if the uh, if the pools broaden. But if you have more requests, uh, then whoever's administering this program is going to be is going to have to devote more resources to the additional request, right? I think those are resources that would be well spent because at the end of the day, they will free up resources. Um, and They're going to be necessarily and, and, spent, right? But, yes, Not just me, well spent. I mean, it's going to be absolutely necessary because there are going to be more requests. There are already exhaustive um, uh, inquiries now into these individual cases that deal not just with whether they meet the criteria, as this gentleman clearly does, but as to whether he should be released, which is the, the point of my story was to say whatever we advise about broadening the criteria and the rest of the criteria, the one thing that we, we absolutely hope that you will do is to say once the Bureau of Prisons makes that determination that this is a person who meets the criteria enunciated by the Sentencing Commission, that there is no family caregiver available, take that to the court. I mean, that is a motion that can be readily taken. You can take away from the Bureau of Prisons the worrying about whether he deserves to be released, is he served enough time in prison, was his crime particularly heinous. This is something that the court knows, knows when it was he was sentenced. Well, but they I agree. I, know I understand if, that, but I'm, I'm concerned about the way the statute reads. And I don't know that the court has jurisdiction to decide any of these things absent a change in the statute. So I, I, the I, mean, prison, I and I think we can make any recommendations that we think are appropriate, but I really think that this process where you're deeply concerned about it can benefit from an analysis as to one, what is going on, and two, is it medical or is it otherwise? You go through that process. That may or may not, may or may not broaden the pool. I don't know. But at least it may address the problem that I see, which is you have 3,000 people apply, you have 250 people pass, uh, go through it, and there's something going on here. Now, it may be that anybody takes advantage of it. I understand that. So numbers don't tell the whole story. But time between making a motion and, and, and resolution of the, of, of the decision does take time. And it will take resources. And I guess your answer to, the, uh, uh, to, to DOJ is, in response to that question, is 
look, it may, it may take more resources. You don't deny that at the front end it takes more resources, but it may result in a savings if, in fact, somebody's eligible. That's Absolutely, and I agree with you that more needs to be done to understand where the delays occur and why they occur. And I think we should also know why there are denials, why are people actually denied, and, and that information is not made available, at, at least so far. Okay, thank you very much. This is extremely helpful, and uh, I hope you stay involved, Dr. Williams. And uh, I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you and very much. I know how much FAM does and PCA, so thank you very much. Thank you.